Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back. It's great to see you. And here we are with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. How are you doing, John? I am exquisitely well. It is 83 degrees here in New York, and um, spring is sprung. Wow. Wow. Good for you. We're having a little bit of a cold snap here in uh, Southern California, but uh, we kind of like it. Mm -hmm. So, John, my question for you today is bistros. The bistro was kind of a French uh, in, invention, uh, and I guess, what, what is it about bistros that people love? Well, the bistro started uh, pretty much after the French Revolution. There had been restaurants in Paris um, before the French Revolution uh, and, uh, and food houses and so forth. But uh, the bistro was an invention after the French Revolution whereby mom and pops basically uh, opened little cook cookeries where you could go in and get four or five dishes and they're mostly regional and became all over France. So if you're, if you're in Paris, it'd be Parisian cooking. And if you're Provence, it'd be Provencal cooking. And it apparently gets its name from the Russians who, after the Battle of Waterloo, came into Paris and was starving and had heard about French food and said, bistro, 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 quick, quick, quick. And apparently that's how the bistro got its name. But, you know, they are beloved and some are fancier than others, but they never rise nor pretend to rise to the fine dining three star Michelin level of either cuisine or, or decor. And um, they still are largely, not entirely, mom and pop organizations, either mama's out front with at the cashier's spot and or sitting people and pa's back, back cooking or vice versa. And they've heard and and that. The the word bistro has been kind of adopted to almost any restaurant, at least in the United States. It's not true French uh, anymore. No, but, 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 but there's a certain thing about yeah. But there, there's a there are associated with French uh, uh, beyond the uh, maybe more high end are cafe, which we of course have adopted for virtually any kind of meal. So. Yeah. Uh, Let's talk, if you would, because, uh, you know, I, I'm a pizza guy. We'll talk about that in another uh, 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 <laughs> segment. But uh, in, in the United States in general, what kind of range or is there a range of cafes and bistros and other fine dining restaurants that you would look to if you were looking for French cuisine? And what makes it French as opposed to just general fare? Well, quite literally, French cuisine are dishes that uh, were created, crafted, and are uh, beloved in France, and they would range from, this is the thing about bistros, in a fine dining restaurant, you won't necessarily find these things that I'm about to speak about, but in a uh, bistro, you could pretty much count on it every single day of the week, unless they're closed on Sunday or Monday. And the blackboard specials be on Monday, we have frog's legs. And on Tuesday, we have cassoulet. And on Wednesday, we have Parisian and gnocchi. But the regular menu is going to have a pâté, maison of some kind. It's probably going to have leeks, either vinaigrette or uh, gratinade. It could, in, in, in right now in May, you'll find lots of white asparagus there. You're always going to find onion soup with a bubbly crust of Gruyere cheese on top. And um, then you'll find mussels and white wine. And of course, when you move into the entrees, there'll be roast chicken or there'll be poulet chicken in cream sauce. And there will be um, steak frites, which is basically uh, kind of a minute steak with um, great French fries. They're always great French fries. Always, you, you, I've only had one limp French fry in my entire life and, and then happened to be in Paris. Um, just one limp one. In. <laughs> And um, and then it would have uh, pied de pork, which is a pork foot, and it will have uh, certain fish dishes, filet of sole, maybe Dover sole mounier with a rich, rich butter sauce. And then there's always going to be four or five cheeses, generally regional cheeses. And then so there's going to be a roquefort, there's going to be a blue cheese, and there's going to be a camembert and a brie and so forth. And then for dessert, you can count on there being mousse au chocolat, chocolate mousse, and there'll be a tart tatin, which is an apple tart. And there may be a creme brulee, which is a cream, uh, burnt, burnt cream, and um, perhaps some sorbets or something. But um, it's it, 
these things don't change because they are so revered and because people want to eat them all the time, calves liver with bacon and, and onions, that they have, in fact, been adopted for uh, all over the world. And uh, so we do have French bistros of the kind I just described here in America, as well as other restaurants that carry those same exact dishes. But what you also find in a French bistro here or there, uh, most specifically there, although they do look different, you're going to have wainscoting on the walls. You're going to have walls that are either off-white or yellowish caused by cigarette cigarette smoke over decades. Now, they don't, can't smoke. <laughs> Koreans can't smoke inside anywhere. You're going to have a white tablecloth or a white piece of paper over a white tablecloth. You're going to have a candle. You're going to have maybe one little flower in a Perrier bottle. Uh, and it's going to be, you're going to be sitting close. They're going to be red or dark brown banquettes with brass railings atop them. And you'll find that the mirrors on the wall will be slightly tilted. And the reason for that is it allows you to see kind of everybody else in the room. Because if they're, if they're flat just like that, you're only going to see straight across vertically. If they're slightly tilted, you kind of look down on more of an expanse of the restaurant. A very nice little trick, which is, is very engaging. Um, the wines are going to be, well, well the, the house wines used to be terrible. Almost always uh, a bad Chablis for the white and a bad Beaujolais for the red. That's no longer true. They are serving regional wines. Silverware will be nice and heavy. Your napkin will be big. Um, all of these little touches. And uh, depending upon the ma and pa operation uh, and the waiters, um, and depending upon their disposition for the day, you will get a good dose of their character, which can be very, very personable and lovable and cordial or a little snippy. But um, you come to love that after a while, too. And the thing is that <laughs> I, you said to me, John, I'm going to Paris next week or I'm going to Marseille or I'm going to Burgundy or something. Tell me to go to a beach. What should I have? Well, I, even if I hadn't eaten there in the last 10 years, I can guarantee you those mussels and white wines and the bouillabaisse in that bistro I send you to in Marseille will taste exactly the way it did when I raved about it 10 years about 10 years ago. Hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. You know, John, except in for, um, you know, the stealing of the term bistro for all these American restaurants that just want to have uh, a little uh, ambiance or something. Um, you're absolutely right on. I never realized the consistency, because I've been to a number of bistros around the country that are, just as you described, French. They they don't have French waiters or, anymore, but in the United States. But the, the decor, the brass, brass yeah. rails and the curtains and the food, the chicken. And the tilted the, mirrors, who knew? And the, and the tilted mirrors. Well, you knew that from... Uh, the old paintings, uh, who's the uh, Toulouse-Lautrec paintings mm. <laughs> of, uh, of the bistros with the p tilted mirrors. But you're absolutely right. That is, that's the hallmark of a, b of a French bistro. It's really French. It's got all those things. And you know what? It doesn't need anything else. Exactly. And nobody demands anything else. I mean, there are modern bistros. And again, they be probably more regional. So even if you are in Paris you may have a Provencal-type bistro. So they're bringing in dishes from Provence that you wouldn't find in a typical Parisian. If you're going to be going down to Alsace-Lorraine, uh, that's where you're going to find German-influenced dishes like choucroute, which is a bunch of sausages and smoked meats with sauerkraut and so forth. Um, if you go to Toulouse, you're going to find yeah. cassoulet, which is beans and, and, uh, and meats and so forth. So um, uh, it will differ from place to place. But the general stock menu, and you know, you can depend on almost all of them being good to terrific because they would not stay open for long, much less 50 years or 100 years. There are some 100 year old bistros in, in, in France, you know. Um, they wouldn't stay open if the uh, locals did not ad uh, adopt them. Um, the locals are very important. The French are very high standards for their food. And if they go once to a bistro that they've been going to for 20 years and those oysters are absolutely impeccable and, and fresh and so forth, uh, they won't go back and they'll tell all their friends. So it's not what it once was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you. I appreciate this because uh, you really hit the nail on the head. Uh, I 
you know, I've been to so many places that call themselves bistros yeah. um, that uh, when you started describing the French bistro, uh, I immediately hearkened back to those few places that I've been that are were truly mm-hmm. French bistros. That, and and what a what a wonderful uh, wonderful cuisine, wonderful experience. Friendly, they're always friendly. It's like being at a club, but like at a local uh, club. And somewhere along the line, maybe you and I and Art can talk about what I would consider at this point the American version of a bistro. I know that a lot of places call themselves bistro, but it's the diner. Mm. The di- you're right. I yeah. Well, so, but but not not to uh, rain on the parade of of the French bistro. Uh, with this wonderful review of what we could expect, I would say to our audience, thank you, John Mariani, and bon appetit. Salut! For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.